Hello, Michael Coleman from Sours Collection, and it's my pleasure to talk with the editorial and sound team from Andor, the latest series from Disney Plus. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk with editor and co-producer John Gilroy, supervising sound editor Margit Pfeiffer, and re-recording mixer, sound designer, supervising sound editor David Accord. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Gosh, I don't know where to start. Maybe with you, David, I feel like you have uh, been through a few tours of duty when it comes to Star Wars. And I mean, specifically what's unique about this show is it, the timing of the story. Um, I think it's really interesting. One of the notes I came up when I was reading about some of the tidbits, some of the Easter eggs was how we kind of mark and establish this. And it, it comes up in the very beginning of saying five BBY, which is, you know, five years before the Battle of Yavin. What can you just say uh, about the timeline of when this series covers? As indicated, it's it's five years before Battle of Yavin, or maybe five years before New Hope, you know, in, in cinematic terms, um, or four, you know, four years and change before Rogue One, in a sense, um, and which is what the show is designed to do, is to follow Cassian, uh, his journey um, leading up to... Uh, the events of Rogue One, like where he came from, why he joined uh, the rebellion, who he is as a, as a, as a person, and just his whole arc um, uh, as, a, as a human um, uh, leading up to those events. So, yeah, uh, we're exploring new planets. We have some, uh, we're getting more uh, ground level view of the rebellion in a sense. Um, we're seeing like the, the, um, the every man view in a way we're not it's it's not uh the the, the macroscopic uh you know, lightsabers and force wielders type thing there's not a lot of you know dog fights uh, in space that kind of it's it's is a very ground level this is like the the gritty dirty part um of the revolution in in a sense yeah, that's great. Uh, John, as an editor and a co-producer on the show, what, what can you say just about the sheer amount of information that we're going to be um, basically the character development across the 12 episodes? I feel like the first episode is always introducing characters and trying to give the audience a sense of the world, like the world building aspects of what the show is about. What, what could you say was you know, maybe the first goal of, of, the, um, of episode one? What did what, what was being conveyed and what could you tell was going to be kind of some of the creative challenges of just getting audiences into this world? Well, I mean, obviously this is all springing forth from, from Rogue One, which is a movie that we, that we love and hold dear. And, um, and when the series came about and Tony, you know, decided to tackle it and they, you know, it was an opportunity to go, to go granular on, on, on all the, like, you know, some of the things we had touched in Rogue One, but, but to really go a lot deeper, um, it explores characters. And as Dave says, you know, their day-to-day -day lives and their motivations, uh, you know, their emotions. Uh, and it was, um, it, the, it's fantastic to work in long form because it really gives you time to explore. I, I've said this in other interviews. I'm, it's my first foray really into television and, and, um, Working on a feature, especially a big feature, you are from day one worried about running time. And, you know, it's just like, how are we going to get it down to two hours? You know, and like they overshoot and they don't have a third act and whatever it is. And and um, this show is really, really well written, uh, uh, presented a great blueprint for us. And and it was uh, it was great that you could let scenes, you know, breathe and become as they would, as I, as they should, and not, you know, not trying to crunch things and make things and sort of lose the context of things. So, uh, you know, it was great in that. And it's just, it's just a really big canvas to paint on for us. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's one gigantic piece of work. It's much, much, much bigger than a, than a feature film. So it was great. It was fun. I had fun. Uh, Margit, what, what could you say about this first planet? We, you know, Ferex is incredibly unique. Uh, the first episode is very dark. There's tons of rain. We're not really quite sure what's going on yet. We just, you know, a guy stumbles into a bar looking for his sister and just like the story unfolds from there. What what, what could you say sonically was being shown or being heard when it comes to uh, Ferrex? Well, Ferrex was a really interesting location. It is a uh, trading hub. So we focused on a lot of languages and accents. And um, we had basically someone from every galaxy. We had um, fictional languages, had peace, and then... Um, in terms of sound design, 
Um, of course, Dave could talk to that more. But uh, in terms of sound design, it was a very thick soundscape. But also shooting, they built a five uh, city block set. And in terms of we had, you know, dozens and dozens of extras moving around on a crunchy gravel track, which we had to remove and replace and loop. And um, so it's it's a phenomenal set. It was not shot on a green screen. It's five city blocks on that planet Ferrix. Yeah. Something that's really unique about this show also is that it, it's, it has a use of camera of, um, of putting the viewer in the perspective of casting in a way that I feel like is just it. you quickly forget that you're watching a scripted show. It just to me, it feels like we're just following along in it, uh, with with characters that uh, I felt like it was a documentary, like a retelling of like this incredible story. Can you talk about um, pacing, John? Uh, how did you guys kind of determine? Because it's very patient. Uh, obviously, there's scenes of heightened action, and we you know we get thrown in the middle of some incredible battles. But can you just talk about the overall tone of how camera is, and and just the the, the look of, of that? Um, you know, the 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 pace of the show was really again, I'll say, was was set by by the scripts, and you know, I know. People at the beginning were going, oh, it's a little, you know, the first few episodes were a little bit slower, um, but they're not really, it, you know, you have to, uh, you have to set the table, right? You need to, you need to set things up. And, and uh, first acts are often uh, a little more deliberate because you need to, you need to do this. And it was always funny. People would go, well, you know, season one was a, so our episode one was a little slower, but then like they got to the ep third episode and they're like, oh my God, it was, it was, you know, so Every time you, you know, you slow down a little bit, you're, you're taking all this stuff in and it really does make it pay off because we had these sort of uh, three episode arcs, more or less, for, for a lot of the show. So, they, you know, they kind of be, you know, the first three episodes were uh, a Ferris chapter. You're on that planet. You're following those characters on, on that planet. And uh, it sort of, you know, comes to a big climax, you know, in the third act, uh, in the third episode. Um, so I would just say... Uh, um, it, we had a really good blueprint and we had, um, and I'd say the other thing about television is everybody's got to be on the top of their game. I mean, uh, you don't just go out and, and shoot a scene, you know, five different ways and then figure it out later in the cutting room. So, the, you know, it, it, there's some really great filmmaking, uh, but to be able to do that, you need to trust the script and then you need to trust your shooting battle plan. And you need to execute that. And um, and you know we were we were just blessed in every department. We really uh, we had we had you know directors, DPs, obviously the sound. Um, we were uh, you know and then and you know I cut it, I cut the first three with um, with Tim Porter, who was another incredibly talented um, editor. And so we had we just had a really good time. That's great, Dave. Can you talk about some of the rules and maybe uh, creative constraints that that this series is kind of using as a, a playbook because I feel like it, this is more gritty. It's more dark. Um, there's um, nuance and texture within the track that I feel like is really, uh, it, 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 like I said, it makes it feel like we're really uh, just right along with Cassian. Uh, how, how would you describe both, you know, the transition from Ferrix and then as we start to like explore some of the other planets, Aldhani, Coruscant, Nemos? the first time we worked with Skywalker was on Rogue One and we were just incredibly impressed with them, you know, the talent and their, their taste and intelligence. And, and um, it's funny because, you know, what's really great sonically is this, that it is that um, uh, Dave and Margit, they just, you know, every, they just got it. Everybody just understood they got it was you know it, when you read these things you know that it's a different it's a different uh, it's a different animal than some of the other television shows but it's definitely a, an extension of row one and 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 um, if you understand it you and you hug it it takes you places I mean right I mean Dave when you're doing the sound you're like you're it uh, you sound it kind of it kind of tells you where to go doesn't it in a way yeah well it's uh, um... That's exactly. Yeah. It's uh, the, the tone of the show, like, like, you know, in, in any project, the, the tone of the show kind of guides, uh, you know, the tone of the sound, the sound design. And this show is, like you say, is very grounded. It's very, you know, um, you're right there with Cassian, the sort of thing. And it's and you want the sound effects, the sound design to sort of mimic that feel. So, yeah. So things like blasters have more of a punchy, you know, classic gun-like sound to them um it, it's a it, it evokes more of a visceral response i think in an audience 
when you, you, you can kind of connect to some of the sound effects in a real way. A lot of the ships have like a traditional jet like sound to them. It, it really helps to sort of uh, make a kind of a diegetic approach to the, to the sound design, which I think uh, helps the show, um, uh, you know, totally. Well, one of uh, the great aspects of these shows is we always get introduced to new droids, and this one was no exception. We have uh, B2 EMO, which is voiced by Dave Chapman. Can you guys talk about just the process of trying to figure out the – because obviously, you know, he uh, Dave was the, you know, I think the performer. Is that right? Behind it. And then they were just yeah, – he was, he was the puppeteer. Yeah, the puppeteer. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny because, you know, we were – we would we, you know, he was doing the voice when we were shooting – and we're working with him and uh, and I and I'd be cutting and I'd, I'd say to Marquis, I go, I go, boy, this guy is good. And like and people are like, well, you know, he's just temporary. We're going to replace him. And and at one point, you know, we did get like a list of all the heavy hitter voiceover people, you know, and there's some real heavy hitters, you know, in the voiceover world. And right, Marquis, we just we, he was just so good. He he could act. I mean, he act, it, we didn't have to replace he hardly has any loop lines in the whole show. Well, That's how good he was. He only had one single line, which was a, an additional line. But he, what was important with B2 is to keep the humanity going in there. Like it was, as Tony sometimes call it, it's the family dog. It's like you want a human connection to this voice. So you couldn't computerize it too much. The whole charm lives in the relatability. And uh, so it makes it very lovable. And that to replace that seemed... I mean, you always attempt to, you always try, you explore every option, but um, Dave Chapman did a phenomenal job. It was, it made no sense to, to replace this. It was perfect. It was really hard to do what he did too, because it's not just the voice. That strange stutter that he yeah. does, that is not, that, that's him. I mean, he's doing it right out of the box. It's not being manipulated. We're not stuttering it. We're not, it's, it's kind of incredible when you think about it. And like the more we live with his his voice, you know, I said to Margina, then Dave and Tony, I, I, I go, what are we doing? I mean, why are we looking? I mean, it's, you know, it's it's right in front of us here. So we just uh, we just grabbed it. We just used it. It was it was fantastic. That's great. Um, Dave, I want you to talk about one of the, the specifics that uh, I think for fans, they'll recognize uh, Cassian's gun, this K-16 Briar pistol. When I read about what it was from, I was like, oh, that's that to me is so funny. It was a callback from Dark Forces, this video game and Battlefront. And it's the first time we we hear this gun. Every, I feel like every show has new guns, but this one is an old one. The, the fun thing about that gun for me is the way it, uh, it cocks, it sort of loads or charges that little flip thing that it does. And that sort of gives us a, our little Cassian signature uh it's it's a t it's a tricky thing when you want to have like a you know, like a signature sound in, in something that's that's a very difficult thing to to sell you know and it, the audience really has to embrace it for it to truly become something signature um, so it, you just never really know what's going to work and what doesn't but um, yeah that little flip that he does and a little whine yeah that's that's a that's a fun little little weapon that he has. Um, uh, that the I guess the prop guys must have designed that setup. It's pretty neat. Yeah, the prop people are amazing. They're just they think <laughs> go to the prop place sometime here. Tony took me to a prop uh, meeting at Pinewood a few days ago, and uh, it was like a show and tell thing. And I just couldn't believe how much how cool the stuff was and how much fun those guys were having making all that stuff. It was just incredible. <laughs> Marky, can you talk about some of the environmental um, aspects? There's always so much busy activity going on. We have, um, you know, marketplaces. We have garrisons. There, it's like every frame, there's a whole story going on in the background. Can you just talk about being conscious and aware of creating these, these spaces for the audience? Oh, yeah. So in terms of uh, environments and spaces, we had everything. We had, uh, you know, in later episodes, we had the prison, we had Aldani, we had uh, Ferrix from a busy marketplace shot on a set uh, with a lot of people, but also to the different types of languages spoken to the, uh, to also, you know, you keep the crowds alive. We had some chanting, which you wanted to embellish and feel and to cut back and forth and feel the amount of people in these scenes. And um it was a great wide variety. I mean, from Canary to the children and speaking in their language and in their environment and tonality. Uh, it's a great opportunity for sound. D David, how would you describe the uh, 
the, it's not even a noise floor. It's just like there's a there's there's interiors and exteriors, and everyone kind of has to have its own signature. So so the audience can basically follow along with giving them giving a place for everything. Uh, do you find that you had to recre- uh, basically recreate new environmental sounds, or or was there kind of a um, you know a, a library that you you could reintroduce again? Well, yeah, these are all new spaces, right? Uh, except for Coruscant, that's our that's a it's a classic. So for Coruscant, yes, we used um, you know the stuff that Ben Burt made from uh, episode uh, two and three, um, peppered in some new, some new things in there. But yeah, for the most part, like Morlana One has a very unique that urban sound with all the sort of strange you know ship buys and whatever is happening in the background there. Um, then the rain, uh, you know, the the jungle planet where we're at where where casa is is a, is a young boy uh creating that environment with with um and there's some you know creatures in the background in, in the distance and 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 that sort of thing ferrex of course uh, as morgie pointed out trade hub so it's a lot of hustle and bustle it's very dusty very dirty you know kind of gritty um lots of people chattering all over the place yeah it's there's a lot of like you say, you want to sort of make sure that the audience is always sort of aware of where they are. And then when we're inside buildings, that was the thing that we focused on was making sure that you still hear some of that outside environment, even when we're inside a building and, and you know, whether it's just like, you know, a crowd or a speeder by or, or whatever it is um, to keep us all geographically uh, in sync. Uh, John, um, can you talk about just the, the, the pacing of some of these action sequences? Because the thing I noticed is different is, uh, there's, you know, these episodes are close to an hour. We have time to, 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 we're not trying to shoehorn in really short, I, I, they're not half an hour episodes. Uh, I feel like a lot of times everything, uh, we don't know where we're going, but we know when we get there, it's going to kind of introduce us to where you know where the characters are there's always a reason for something that's happening um can you just talk about the overall structure and pacing of of how you guys decide how much time you commit to you know various sequences how how do you get everything within you know the time that you have per episode um i'd say planning and preparation and and then uh you kind of know uh on the page how long it's going to be and then you um uh, again, you like they, they they're pretty elaborate, um, but they really have you really have to pick your choices, you know, make your choices before you start shooting. You can't I can't you can't just overcover everything. So so uh, it was everything was really intelligently covered. And, you know, we just I just do what I do. And I um, uh, the, whatever that pacing is, it's sort of like a and it's sort of in your mind and you just sort of go through and you kind of you kind of feel it. Um uh, I love the I love the big action sequences in three, and I and I really especially like the one in uh, in six. I thought the heist was really that that was uh, that was a really proud achievement. I thought that was just really clever the whole thing. And um, what I also loved about six is like we had the backdrop of the Eye of Aldani, the uh, uh, you know not to give too much away, but the, the sort of there's a meteor shower. And I thought what uh, what ILM came up with for you know for the look of that thing. And then what you guys came up with for the sound of that thing was really, was just awesome. It just really kind of put the icing on the cake for that episode, uh, you know, against the heist, against the whole heist. Yeah. Talk about the use of Foley within the show. I feel like there's a huge emphasis when it comes to, to footfalls and kind of giving character to various characters from droids and all the various, you know, different species within the show. Yeah. Just describe the role of Foley within the show. Foley is a huge part of this show. Um, back to the sort of uh, hyper-realistic, uh, diegetic sort of feel of the show, obviously you need, um, you know, our, our, our Foley to be a little um, heightened in that sense. Uh, everything's a little a little gritty, a little rusty. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure we feel all those, all those like leather jacket movements and um, the, the weight of the guns and, and, the, and, and the, the gravelly footfalls, all that stuff is really important to feel, to put the, the viewer in, you know, in, in space and in that 
um, in that environment. There's a huge role that composer Nicholas Breitel has, which is, you know, music carries great emotion and pacing. Tony, uh, how, how does how did you find, you know, working with Nicholas and and just understanding the role of music within the, within the show? Nick did, did a great job for us. Um, you know, I should mention uh, the other part of the Wrecking Crew post-production sound team here. There's Dave and there's Margit. And we also have this guy, John Finkley, who's a music editor. Who works with us and john is uh um just another huge piece of the puzzle so uh you know so you know we kind of go through and we at some point we have to sort of temp do temp music for these shows um and then and then they, they then nick will get the shows and he'll go to town he worked very tony gilroy worked very closely with him on this one because they're both new york you know new yorkers and they both live on the upper west side so they got to spend a lot of time together and um, and Nick is just awesome and, and talented and um, and, uh, you know, just having our story straight and, and also not making sure there was never a thing where um, uh, where music was competing against, you know, the rest of the sound or vice versa. It was always sort of everybody kind of knew what every scene needed and there was no there was no uh, there was no, you know, battle of the bands when it came to. <laughs> To trying to marry sound this sound to that sound, so it was like it was really it was great. But um, um, yeah, uh, Nick Nick did, did he did an awesome yeah. job. Something that came up when I was reading just about uh, with Tony Gilroy of, of him basically emphasizing, you know, the characters don't know where the story is going. I, as us, we kind of know because of of Rogue One, we know where this is heading, but uh, the characters don't know that, and so there's kind of a you know this blindness that they have. They're they're just. They're on this adventure. They don't know what's happening. So, uh, Margit, how, how can you just describe of knowing that we're headed in a certain direction? How, is there is there you know kind of uh, the attention to that detail of knowing that at some point there's a continuity that that follows through this show? I mean, that will apply more to the second part of the series. Um, but on the first one, I mean, you established the new locations, which we, you know, had touched upon. Um, these are all new places to go. So you can actually create a new uh, sonic environment. And then as you get closer to where we ultimately will end up, you want to fold that in. Obviously, you want to have all the signature sounds and the sound design mostly specifically or the languages to have all of this correctly um, in tune and leading up to the crescendo, which is, you know, ending up where Rogue One started initially. Yeah, it's to me, I, I just, you know, I, I really enjoy the um, uniqueness of the show. Like I said, the use of camera, the style of editing, I think just across the board, it it feels like, yes, we are in the world of Star Wars, but we are in a, its own world. It, it feels like um, just... Uh, a, some, something that we haven't as fans explored before. Dave, what what to you, like I said in, at the top, you've worked on numerous Star Wars shows, many characters. What what has Andor provided you from a standpoint of characters or just new challenges that uh, that you weren't expecting? No secret, this is the first Star Wars show where we're, we're not featuring, uh, or at least heavily featuring any of like the classic Star Wars characters or Star Wars places or, you know, some of the Star Wars, you know, the um force related things you know it's all that sort of big picture stuff we're not we're not seeing and because we're ground level and because of the tone of the show um we obviously don't want to lose any of the legacy sounds or the legacy feel of star wars there's you know 40 plus years of of that we don't want to abandon it um so but you want to incorporate this sort of new tone this sort of uh new approach to to the to the franchise um uh, in, with sound too we don't want to and you know like like having nick Bertel, that that's a very new approach to to, to scoring star wars so you know the all in um we want to um embrace that new uh feel that new approach so yeah that's there's a there's a big challenge there um to uh give it uh you know a fresh coat of paint in terms of sound and and uh, re, you know, reevaluate, you know, Star Wars sound, but also incorporate classic sound as well and sort of um, hopefully uh, marry those two successfully. Mm. You know, I, I see Andor as as investing in the in the in the in the Star Wars franchise, you know, by by, as Dave said, by expanding the world, but 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 keeping a firm grasp on the world and and understanding that world. Um, 
we're just we're just sort of broadening the horizons for what this franchise could be or where it could go in the future. Or uh, yeah, it feels to me like an investment, you know? Um, 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 I just want to touch upon the last episode. Uh, there's this incredible procession that happens that to me, it's uh, about seven minutes long, but it introduces something that I, I haven't really seen, which is like trying to introduce this kind of practical um, use of, of sound and music. It's a, like a funeral proce procession and there's kind of like a New Orleans uh, through the streets. Uh, can you guys talk about just the in incredible creative challenges? My understanding is that Tony and Nick, that was one of the first cues they worked on together. But when it came together in the edit, it just created this in intense... Um, yeah, just just tension really throughout the the whole uh, section of, of of that episode. Yeah, it was plan. It was really planned out. They, it was the first piece of music they wrote together, uh, and um, and it was mocked in. You know, they did. You know, when they when they had their location scout, or whatever, they they did a lot of. They actually kind of fleshed the whole thing out, and they with the, with the instruments, and was sort of trying to be a, a New Orleans funeral sort of, uh, sort of vibe, and it. Uh, the planning really paid off because it really, you know, it really, you know, it's a whole bunch of disparate people in this in the city, you know, playing and then the converging. Um, uh, it, it was uh, it, it the planning all made it very elegant. And then and it was and it was a great tee up to, um, you know, to what what Marva says in that in that uh, in her famous speech. Uh, David or Margie, can you talk about the just just crafting that sequence? Uh, it's like a pretty amazing sonically just experience it it's like echoing through the streets like there's a lot of kind of consideration thoughts there's the, the percussion of you know from this tower and yeah kind of mixed it to because we, we keep moving uh, to different parts of ferrix or whether we're right there with the procession or we're with uh you know with, with bix and her cell or we're with you know with, with cassian or wherever we are um this it's this procession that is heard and but it's heard differently because of you know distance and building structures and all that so we wanted to make sure you know just we we created the space wherever the cut was like this is this is where that music this is what it sounds like here this is what it sounds like here this is what it sounds like here and then it kind of gets closer and closer you know until like you know they're all in the street now and and it's now it's really big and it's really filling the whole space and then it and then it just stops and all the what you know and then of course you know and some you know we've got the the guy banging on the anvil later in the in the show and that has a similar sort of uh we a little more earlier in episode three but that is a similar sort of approach is like wherever you are in ferrex it's going to sound a little bit different but everybody does hear it there's so many details in the show i feel like I, we could go i mean from speeder bikes and death droid troopers and just all the planets you, like there's so, there's so much material that is presented across the 12 episodes it's a huge accomplishment uh you know congratulations you guys on just this incredible effort the fan response has been incredible i, I think you know we're so excited for what's to come i'm not going to say what the post credit scene revealed but when i saw that i was just like you've got to be kidding me because <laughs> Well, what, what, we're, what we're talking about, because like I said, where we know we're going, where it's connecting, is a pretty incredible story, and it's so exciting. Yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. Such a pleasure, and yeah, I can't wait for season two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for having us. Thanks.